So uh, we're developing an electric car in Lund, a uh, next generation electric car, something really different to what you've seen out there today. Um, the main reason is because um, if we think about cars today as how they are on the streets, they're incredibly, incredibly complicated machines, it's super difficult to make very very many thousands of different combinations of suppliers and so forth that you can have and thousands of little pieces of steel that all stamp together in very expensive presses and they all get put together in a, and welded together into one single very complicated machine a machine that hasn't really changed a lot over the last hundred or so years uh, except for a couple of uh, little new features here or there. Um, but this machine, this very complicated two tons of machinery, when, when I walk down the streets of Malmö or Stuttgart or Munich or, or, uh, hello, or Beijing or Lon London or Tokyo or so forth, I see these same machines really not carrying more than one person and not driving much faster than a bicycle. Um, which, which, which I feel begs the question is, is there another way? Is there another way? Are there other people out there that also see this same disparity and wonder, is there a different way to build this machine so that we, so that our objective is not to build a car, but to solve the problem of city mobility? Um, and that's what we're doing, starting again with the automobile. It's a little electric city car called Unity nearby. Um, here in Lund, yeah, uh, it's largely made of uh, biocomposites or different forms, diverse forms of composite materials. So that means really pressed forms of uh, like high pressure, high heat resin and fibers of different combinations. The most common is carbon fiber, as you know, probably, uh, but we can also replace them fibers and resins with more bio friendly materials. And then we can think about the vehicle in the context of its entire life cycle. Are there any electric car fans here? We got a couple. Oh, shit. There's a couple. Um, why do you like electric cars? Um, unfortunately to say, electric cars are exactly the same. Uh, no, no, absolutely, 100% they do not have to be. Why? Because that machine was designed, that a lot of steel machine was designed to host the incredible engineering challenges of heat, friction, and vibration. These are things that are not uh, problems with the electric motor. Electric motors are really well designed for a lightweight machine that's zippy and lean around the city, uh, but it doesn't demand the same big steel structure. Any other reason? The energy side of uh, electric cars, it's on its way to changing, as we all know. And uh, that's going to take a little time, but I think we're making great grounds. But on the question of environmental sustainability, uh, I, for one, would prefer they didn't use that. It feels a little like uh, green marketing to me, simply because we have numbers, we, ha we have all of the statistics to know that it's not more environmentally friendly to remove uh, a big combustion engine and replace it with an overpowered electric powertrain with an oversized lithium ion battery. Uh, in fact, if we look at the life cycle of a Tesla, no shitting on Tesla, they're very good friends and I see the camera there and they're doing a wonderful job and making the market great for everybody and it's really inspiring and appreciated. But over the life cycle, they are only fractionally more sustainable than uh, a, a combustion engine vehicle. And this is because the emissions is only a small piece of it. The very taxing part is this complicated steel structure that's really not designed for the mobility needs of modern con uh, commuters in a city. In fact, a bicycle is the best form of transportation that I've seen. And when that's not enough, do we all really need another two tons of machine? I don't think so. Emissions is a completely different question. Emissions uh, 
relative to the global emissions, they're, they're minuscule. But because these emis emissions are densely occurring where we live, they have a terrible impact on our health. Uh, I think electric cars should be saying, we get rid of emissions, so we get rid of the terrible health impact. If you're wondering what that is, I, I encourage you to Google it. Um, you'll find studies like a recent study by MIT that showed that in the United Kingdom, on average, for the whole United Kingdom, not in London City, I mean the green fields, the green fresh air fields of the UK, on average, 13,000 people a year die prematurely from vehicle emissions, 11,000 from car accidents, less, 9,000 from breast cancer, and suicide and homicide and all the other stuff we're afraid of is less than that. But we have technology already that is robust and common uh, to solve this problem straight away. I think that's the best part about electric cars. But I think uh, when we consider the environment, it's very clear that we need to really rethink the rest of the machine. Uh, and that's what we're doing at Unity. And a core part of that is interaction design. Um, can I just ask a show of hands who here are interaction designers or designers, school designers? Huh. Okay. So I give you a word of warning. I'm not a schooled interaction designer or a designer. I, I'm somebody that spends a lot of my life uh, immersed in the role, but I, I don't have any formal education in it. Um, and when I thought about this uh, invitation from Ahmed, Ahmed, I thought, okay, interaction design, what, what do I have to offer such a group that is well-schooled on this topic? Uh, and I consider my role in the company, Unity, um, in the terms of interaction design. And that starts really boiled down to the very basic principles of the machine, um, as with, with all of it. Uh, if, you, if you think, uh, if, I, if I say to you interaction designers, I say, okay, I want you to invent the car of the future, I mean, why would you want to do, obviously the car of the future would be better than what we have. So there is some kind of reason for it. The way you operate it, the way you interact with it, perhaps you would redesign it for ergonomics or perhaps you would redesign it for a more, to invent a more compelling way to operate the machine. And I would say you have absolute creative freedom. You can do whatever you want, design around the human, except there's a little tiny catch as part of this deal you have to also consider that there is a window directly to your left and a passenger directly to your right, a seat here and a roof there. You operate the machine with uh, pedals and a steering wheel based around a steering column. But go crazy. Uh, it's, it's a very specific box that you have to uh, design around. So when uh, Hamid said, um, come speak at this event, I really was thinking, what should I talk about? And then uh, I thought about that's the beginning of what's fundamentally different. Freedom in design and freedom in creativity so that we can change the way that we design it. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, so how do we create a blank canvas in automotive? Um, so first of all, we need to understand why we have these interaction points that we have. We must understand where they come from. If we can already understand that for biological reasons, because of biological flaws, humans always relentlessly follow the same patterns over and over again, and they distrust anything that deviates from those patterns. Uh, if we understand that as a given, we can't just trust that whoever invented the steering wheel invented the one perfect means of interaction for all of human history. Of course, that's not the case. When we see spaceships, they don't have just a normal steering wheel. Um, so why do we have a steering wheel and pedals? Does anybody have an idea? Let's just bring it back to the start. So initially, we steer... We go forward, backwards, left and right, faster, faster, slower, slower, everything with our hands. It's quite an intuitive way to drive. 
But then, when we remove the horse, which is carrying out these functions, we ditch the horse and we have two big ass wooden wagon wheels to turn. We actually don't have power steering yet in that time. So, by the way, electric cars were common then. They were first. They were first before the other ones. It's almost like there's a business model involved here somewhere that, that uh, impacted that. But we've got this big wagon wheel, so we have a big round steering column. So we've got, to, we've got to steer these big babies, and that means going forward and backwards, we need whatever is left over because we don't have cool swipe sensors or joysticks or anything else that's possible yet. Um, so we have these pedals, and we have this big steering wheel, and, and then humans go for the next hundred years. Well, that was the best design. That was so good. We never, ever have to deviate from that, regardless of developments in technology. Of course, this is, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's unlikely that, that we could never free ourselves from these basic interaction points. Um, so that's what we call freeing ourselves from the mechanical properties of the machine it means we can design the interaction around the human, around the user, and around what their needs are, and not around the, the, the demands of the mechanical properties of the machine. So this, in technical terms, is called a steer-by-wire system. It means we remove the mechanical linkage between the driver and the road and the machine, and we replace them with electronic signals. It is uh, old technology robust technology. It's not something crazy that we've invented now. It's common in fighter jets and boats and so forth. So technically we could build a car just with a Sony controller. The problem is uh, with doing just like that or doing a Saab once did a little joystick one or, or so. The problem is, uh, thanks for making me think about this, um, when we also design this, we know that public uptake is a really tricky one. You can't just design what's necessarily perfect. You have to design something that appeals to the masses. So uh, a way to explain it to all of our guys, I, this is my own uh, crazy way of explaining it. There is a diminishing marginal return of... Uh, Weird, no, weird is spelled different. Weirdness and uh, satisfaction. If we increase the weirdness, it often increases the satisfaction by a whole bunch until it starts to decrease and gets a little bit too weird. Uh, we should ideally aim for something over here. And I feel that uh, if we look at, there's a lot of parts of our... Uh, the way that you know people drive cars and so forth there's kind of like an edge in order to get it really to really change something as fundamental as the steering wheel we have to be shocking enough to get attention but we can't be too shocking that people are thinking like whoa you you're gonna swipe to go left and right or use head head gestures it's a little too weird it's a little uncomfortable uh, we need to feel like we're hanging on to something especially if it's a sports machine uh, but um, but we absolutely can accurately steer the machine with a PS3 controller, no problem. Um, I don't know how bad it is to have a beer on camera, but I, it's an Aust I have an Australian passport, so I, <laughs> I figure it's, <laughs> it's fine. Um, so we, f we free ourselves from this. We just have the psychological barrier to deal with. We have to find different ways to approach that and what's the appropriate balance in order to deal with that in a way that that's not too scary and people can actually do it. Um, something that I always say to our team is that we might in this process end up at the steering wheel, but we absolutely do not start at the steering wheel. <laughs> we, we start by creating a clean slate with the help of a steer by wire system and electronic interface and then we work towards designing this thing for the for the very very best means of operating and interacting with the machine um, so that's uh, that's the basics of uh, what I was thinking about this uh, this presentation to just uh, start from those principles does anybody have any comments
So uh, on our car, sure. Um, we will have uh, we'll have windows on our car because I mean that's just a great part of the experience of driving to be able to have see the world around you. Um, on our vehicle, uh, this is a great segue into another piece of interaction design discussion that we can have. Um, on our vehicle, we will have a screen, a big, full uh, canopy, a glass uh, canopy. It's made out of polycarbonate with a, a layer of glass on top. Um, in the process of designing the machine, where we you know, start as a research phase, and we start looking at all of the different technologies that the new machine should be based on, not just automatically basing it on the same mechanical properties, the same big heavy steel machine. If we start again with a blank canvas, we have to look at what are the technologies that this is based on. Um, and one really important piece of the interaction and the operation of the machine is to be able to augment the senses of the driver so that they're engaged in their driving experience. So just to talk about the steering wheel and what the downside of being engaged with the driving experience with the steering wheel. Does anyone know what homeostasis means? Um, maybe this is a, a bad ex idea. But Imagine you're driving in your car and you have this car that you become feeling so safe with. They make it to be so big and heavy. It's a like one of these big tanks that they're driving through the city, Volvo XC90 or something like that. You're sitting there and you're operating it with your feet. Shouldn't say Volvo. Also friends. <laughs> Hummer, a Hummer. And you just feel so safe and you, you really, uh, you know, left and right is the, the result of turning this wheel uh, and operating these pedals and you're in this big, safe, heavy machine. So you're significantly less engage with your experience. You're not really watching where you're going. You're relying on your senses as they are. Um, we know that accidents are not deliberate. We know they're physically accidents. You didn't see it. You didn't, you didn't see the elk. You didn't see something else. So in order to alleviate this situation, we've really considered the senses of the driver, the very best AI in the world there is, which sits in all of our heads, and just uh, augmenting this uh, with the, the use of a heads-up display. Again, very robust technology, old technology, been around for a long time, great place to start. Um, so we start with this proven technology. The difference is we add on a computer that's so crazy and beefy that has never existed before. In fact, uh, the, v the computer in our machine is eight times more powerful than what's in a Tesla Model X. Uh, the basic reason behind this is because the old reason you bought a car was bigger and shinier and faster and look at me, mine does 2.4 seconds and yours does 2.6 seconds and there are old values but for those you need a huge battery and a huge powertrain and these are not necessarily good for the people that want to make an environmentally good choice but we should not ask them to compromise. They can already buy a bicycle so a machine that is attractive enough and the new values that we like are computing power, like with our smartphones or so, that kind of machine and the kind of uh, things you can get it to do because of the computing power within it. So we combine this old technology and we, we, we put it together with a powerful machine. We create this crazy heads-up display which augments your senses in ways uh, that have never been seen before. I'll come to you in a second. Um, a really easy stat, this is the easiest stat of all, uh, there's many more worse stats, but 250 people a year die from running into elks in Sweden. That's something I <laughs> quite shocked at myself. There's many other things that, that kill people other than the poor old elk. But this is again an accident, it is not a deliberate, you did not deliberately smash into an elk. You just didn't see it, but the car always sees it, in our case. So then with the heads-up display, you're looking through the screen, it's a full screen heads-up display, and you can make the elk glow or have a big bobbing arrow above its head or something like that, uh, so that you can therefore augment your senses. If you don't react in time, of course the vehicle can give you higher degrees of, uh, of uh, information, buzzing and sounds and so forth, and then of course reacting. It's quite a simple thing to solve 
because the machine always knows when a car is there and we just need to, to augment your senses a little more. Hmm? Yeah. I th it's great that your uh, grandpa had, uh, ha had such utility from the machine for a long time. Sadly, it's... Yeah. Pro provided the car is designed with that in mind. You know what's uh, really, really crazy about how cars today are designed? They're really not designed to be f for their life cycle. They're designed to break down. It's part of the business model. We know they make more money out of the service model. Uh, every year you have to get stuff changed and then out of warranty parts break down. You've got to buy them back from there and, and so forth. Of course, with the electric car, we can again overcome this because we can build a machine that just has more longevity um, and we can design it in a modular form. I wouldn't say that it has a life cycle more than uh, 10 years. Um, we can make it have a longer life cycle, but in fact, we just, I mean, over the course of 10 years, the way advancements are happening right now, you can advance so much faster than you ever could. Um, I would say at the end of a 10-year period, that machine needs to be ready to uh, be salvaged for parts or, or uh, broken down or reskinned as something else. I mean, the, when it's made in a, a modular form so that you have a, a base platform, uh, you know that this form fits the cities we live in, so the form itself can fit uh, for another 20 or 30 years perhaps but uh, not in its original format. It should be simple to break down and swap and change. Uh, this design here is effectively uh, just a series of molds, very simple uh, construction of molds. Again, not many, many pieces of steel put together, but uh, we can have it in as low as three molds. We're gonna have uh, more molds because of needing to be able to swap panels and so forth out. But uh, those molds are made out of biomaterials largely. We do use some carbon fiber and so forth, but we're using these cool advanced new resins where you can recover the, 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 the carbon fiber from the resin and then uh, reuse it. Uh, and actually there's really nice business models associated with the back end of, of the life cycle as well. Um, so the car itself, I would say, doesn't have longer than a 10 year life cycle simply because it's really designed for people to always be upgrading it. Um, but then those materials are not uh, wasted. At the end of their life, many of them can end up just on your garden uh, because they're biocomposites or biomaterials. The battery is a tricky one, but uh, what's really important is we are designing, uh, designing it so that it can be evolved over time. Like I said, there's parts that you cannot deviate from carbon fiber because it's just so much better than everything else by a long way but it's only a few precursors that you need to be able to change and nobody's really attacking that so if somebody attacks that and puts some money into it i'm sure we can change a couple of the carbon precursors and then all of a sudden have a bio version and when you're developing it, developing it all manufacturing it as we are you can simply switch out the the materials um so yeah, I think that's... F I like the idea that, um and the battery's a tricky one. That's also something you need to be able to evolve over time. Uh, it's also modular in its own sense, so we can switch out things when they're dead, and then they can find another life somewhere else that we're already working on. But it's still lithium-ion, and lithium-ion has... Uh, it, it's very energy-intensive in its creation. It, it requires a huge amount of heating. Um, it's you know using rare earth metals uh, on a massive scale and we can overcome this with sodium ion so we designed so that we can switch out sodium ion as soon as possible sodium at the end of its life is significantly easier to manage it is not a rare earth anything and it does not require any heating in its uh, in, in its development so uh, materials are really important but the design of the form factor so that these can be changed out and evolved over time is really important too. Um, I'm not sure how that relates to interaction design though. If I, if I, if I try to stay on the, on the subject here, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's how, we, uh, that's how we think about how to design this machine. 
If oh, yeah, sorry. You, you know, it's fascinating in, in automotive when you say, "Oh, the UX or UI designers are a side point." Something that completely blows my mind is the low res screens in the car and the shitty significantly lower than what they can actually achieve heads up displays and so forth the interfaces that they're designing for even if you look at suppliers now we, we can't use automotive suppliers because they just don't have oled screens that are really sick screens and really really sick heads up displays they're designing for really outdated stuff while the world is completely used to something fresh and they're used to uh, really rapidly updated uh, interfaces so uh so that's something that we're doing very differently uh respecting that desire of people to have interfaces that work well uh interfaces that match their needs it comes down to positioning of the machine we do not position it as a car or it is not something that you sell in a car yard it's something that you sell direct sales to the consumer online it is a piece of consumer electronics and this is already on the internet, but that's all right. Um, you'll probably be able to buy it in a media marked Europe wide. Um, that's in a similar way you would buy an iPhone or something like that. And you should have the same demands as you would have of one of those devices. The way I interact with it is it's not like a Nokia 3110 plastic button phone where I, I pla punch all these plastic buttons. It's just something completely different. We free ourselves from the mechanical properties. We make a screen that's uh, able to achieve so much more, and we have a, sig a significant graphics card that can push it all, a computer that can push it all. So, well, I mean, if we talk about the actual way you, you interact with it, and you talk about uh, sustainability, if you go towards those new modern ways of interacting with a device, uh, not only is it significantly cooler, significantly easier, it's also much better for the environment than molding out a plastic button. Right now, you can go into a normal Volkswagen or, or a Volvo or one of these cars, not the latest Volvo, older Volvos. Many cars today, I would suggest there's 100 million new cars made each year. I would guess there's at least 50 buttons in each. That's half a billion plastic buttons molded each year. I would uh, predict that maybe 300 million of those buttons are never touched <laughs> because the person has no idea what the hell they do. And they come from completely different suppliers. And if, you're, if you care to look, you'll notice they often don't even have the same font. They're, they're coming from different sides of the world. But they are just a, a plastic molded button. And it is not because of a, a, a technological incapacity to do better. It's largely... I guess design hierarchies, cultures, there's not really a need to, to change something better. But it's much easier to just have little screens and have gestures and have uh, touch screen buttons that don't require plastic molding. I think it's very important to note in this uh, discussion, though, uh, the machine behind me is uh, within the European L70 heavy quadricycle classification. So it's a lower regulatory category than a normal M1 vehicle. An M1 vehicle you see on the roads here has extremely many regulations. You can have 40 pages of documentation just for how to do the door clasp. But in our category, you don't even need to have a door. So that is a very unique opportunity for interaction designers because then they don't say, well, what are the, what are the stipulated boundaries that we have to operate within? It's worse than that, believe me. Stipulated regulatory boundaries, then your economies of scale, and then your hierarchies on top of that. It's, it's significantly more complicated of a, of, a, of a challenge to design within that framework. But in our framework, it says you don't have economies of scale. You can start fresh. Um, and uh, you just have an opportunity to do something completely different. You don't have to have an even door. You can look at a door and say, what does it do? Okay, it's keeping my stuff safe. It's keeping the rain off me. If someone runs into me, I need to protect for that. And you can design for those values and not design for the 40-page documentation on how a door handle is supposed to be. Many automakers use those lower regulations to then make a super cheap car. 
because you don't have to crash test it, you don't have to pedestrian crash test it, so you don't even have to make it safe. I mean, a bicycle's not safe, why would you bother? In our case, we bother because we want to make a mainstream product. We want to create the biggest impact we possibly can. Um, we, we don't want to continue walking around the streets and breathing in these gases. And when I breathe these gases in and look at these oversized, overweight machines, I really think they're silly. Uh, I really, really think they're silly. And I, I don't want to continue uh, living on this planet when I know it's quite simple. It's not simple, it's a great challenge. That's why we're here. But there are robust technologies that are sufficient to solve these problems. Um, uh, and that's an exciting thing. That's part of uh, creating a blank canvas, you could say. Uh, not just looking at the same old pattern that says, okay, we're going to be a car company. Let's so start designing a car, but instead look for opportunities to really make something different. And in this case, it spans from uh, different values that you would seek to sell the car based on, uh, right down to the regulatory environment, which is significantly more simple. In fact, in the L7E category, there is a clause, uh, EU, I don't remember the numbers. Our guys know the numbers. Uh, one of the clauses that they've specifically put in here, it's such a peculiar clause to have in a regulation because it specifically says, if you can think of a, it's in the EU Commission speak. So I'm going to do it in Australian Lewis speak. Um, if you can find a way to achieve these things that's either as good or more sustainable as what we currently have, we'll consider it. It's, it's so weird because even without that clause, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. If it's significantly better than what's there, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to get momentum around the idea and I'm going to go and lobby for it. And... Uh, if it's much better, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to attempt to jam it down your throat until we can get it done. But they actually put a clause in there that says, uh, please have a go at it. Obviously, because somebody at the commission thought, geez, European cities would be much better if we didn't have all these two-ton machines driving around at 15 kilometers an hour with one person sitting in the car. They're not really focused on what they're doing. They're probably looking at their phone because it's giving them more dopamine than the road is. Um, and that's something that we, I think we can solve with a combination of all these uh, different variables and a unique approach to design where we don't necessarily respect the status quo. We fundamentally don't respect the status quo because we, we, know, what, we know why it's there and why, why it becomes that way. Um, um, we're getting to the end of the speech now. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed this. I, I just want to tell you a little bit about what our plans are in this region. So we have uh, now uh, some really great new partnerships developed. Uh, Siemens is joining us as a, a foundation partner. And together uh, in Malmo here probably, unless we can find a better location. But, but right now I think the best location is in the, in the port of Malmo. There's an old DHL building um, that we've been looking at. And it's economically viable and it ticks every box logistically unbelievable to be able to have our manufacturing facility there you have uh, ships docking on one side unloading raw materials and 10 pre-assembled subsystems and then a purely automated lights out factory that uh, builds the composites and assembles the vehicle and then they drive off the end of the production line back onto the boat and we have a made in Sweden car uh, that's shipped around the world I know that sounds super ambitious, and I know ambition is not something that's viewed even positively in Sweden. It's something that I, uh, it's something that I, it's, it's one of the things I just have to carry with my backpack and just keep on going. Um, but that's what our plan is. Uh, any questions? A lot of inspiration from um, just looking around in the world. Um, I've done a lot of different companies and I uh, and different projects and so forth, uh, achieving different things, connecting very many dots, and then myself feeling ready to do something really big and at the same time being quite inspired by the like almost almost like vigilante 
strategies of Tesla. I think their, a lot of their strategies were almost uh, irresponsible, and I find that uh, quite inspiring. Um, I remember in a Tesla Gigafactories documentary, which you can check on Discovery Channel, you can find on YouTube, I read it on, I saw it on YouTube, their designers said, we, you know, we built this perfect car, blah, 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 but there's a moment where the designer says, you know, we really didn't need to build this kind of car. With an electric car, you don't have a transmission, you don't really need the front, you don't really need the back, you don't need any of this stuff. We could have made a spaceship car, but we needed to get people to know that electric cars were legitimate. In other words, they had to build a car that you're already expecting, the, the car that's already in the mass market, and we just have to do it better and faster and shinier and bigger and whatever your values are, we need to win, we need to beat them in the context of electric car. Why? Because you have this broad spectrum of a market and a very nice, neat little wedge that uh, wants something really sustainable. And if you design for them, you're not really having that kind of impact. You have to design something that appeals to everybody. So if, you, if you're a meathead, you don't care, you want the fastest car in the world, we got to win that person so that person starts telling the world about how electric cars are better. So that's what they designed for. And uh, it really just stuck in my head for a long time. Like they know this is not the ideal, most highly optimized electric car. And even our vehicle has a difficult product market fit in America or Australia for that matter. But if you're here in Sweden, all of a sudden, like the really the most progressive place in the world, where you can you can connect on the, the rational side well and people get it and you can connect on the the other side you know you need to win the hearts as well uh, that's something that you could do here it, it was clearly like a really perfect opportunity to build that highly optimized machine that was the the inspiration I would say yeah So, uh, yeah, because that's people looking there and you have this curiosity and it uh, also links to your, your uh, chemical system. When you see that, you go, oh my God, I got to try it. It won't let me go until I get a chance to try it. It's a combination of uh, connecting the dots and then having a lot of chemicals just pouring into your system going, wow, that looks really fast. Look at their reactions. It's amazing. We, uh, like I said, we can't compromise on those. We have to create that wow factor of our own. When we unveiled this machine in August in the facility in Malmö, we will have our own one of them that's so fucking crazy it will blow your mind. Uh, and it's not, it's not uh, that zero to 100. But if they got the whole ball rolling and you have a lot of people here in Europe that you know, want something emissions free, they want something sustainable, they don't want to compromise on some kind of performance, but they surely don't need to necessarily carry around a 90 kilowatt hour battery in order to achieve that kind of uh, acceleration. Like that, I think it's wonderful, but there's many people that do not want a machine like that. I would love to buy a new car. I haven't had a new car for a long time. I don't want to buy a new car, sorry. But I haven't had a car for a long time. In Australia, you have to have one. The only option, the only car I would buy is a Tesla. But, I mean, it's just a huge amount of machine and a huge amount of battery for stuff that, like, it's a super nice gimmick to go so fast. But, I don't know, around Malmo, do we do we need to go that fast? Our, our car from 0 to 60 will beat just about any sports car in in the city simply because it's an electric car. You can just switch the energy on like a light switch um it will it won't be the tesla not a chance that's that's like the number one but for the people that don't want to pay for that much battery so they can achieve that um like for example a second family car bringing your children to school or something like that and a price point that fits for a machine that fits um or for someone like myself or other uh, like millennials that that want to have a car but don't have this parking space or or for people in Asian countries which is really what this is designed for European dense European cities and uh, directly into Asian markets uh, the logo the way it sounds the brand everything is designed for that 
there a Tesla is a tricky one. You, infrastructure is really, really critical if you have a 90 kilowatt hour battery that you need to charge fast. For us to have a leaner machine, significant, I mean 400 kilograms worth of machine, um, you just, you just, pure physics says you use significantly less energy. And if you can design for the infrastructure situation as it is in our car, that means the, the battery charges fast, it's 10 times smaller than a Tesla, and there's a removable section that you can charge under your desktop at work. It means we can design for the infrastructure problem instead of designing for the old values, which is it has to go faster than everyone else, and now we have an infrastructure problem. If we, if we, can, if we can design for your actual needs and for the problems that you have, we, we can overcome these. But, um, man, that was one of the things that really drew me to the Tesla thing when I first saw people in there crazy acceleration and then I'm thinking what most other people are thinking even if I don't buy one I don't even want to buy one but oh, god damn I want to try it uh, <laughs> question yeah oh, 100% of course uh, again with the electronic steering and the the whole electrical system autopilot or autonomous driving significantly significantly simpler challenge than navigating an M1 car through New York City with a family in, in the rain when a girl runs out on the road with a ball. It's much, much simpler if you're designing it in a lower regulatory category, all electric. It's steer by wire, exactly the same as an RC car is also steer by wire. So you, you, you effectively have a bigger RC car. The regulatory environment's easier. And if you design that not for a competition angle but if you design it for the actual problems then you can find it to s the actual pain points is significantly simpler in our car initially we'll have uh, like traffic jam mode is the easiest one on earth to do we can cure traffic jams on this planet now it's really easy with common open source technology by the way all our autonomous technology is and will remain open source because that's so revolutionary to have uh, autonomous cars. Our stuff will always be open source. Um, but then we solve for problems like, check this one out, 100 million new cars each year are made. 90, they have a short life. At the end of their life, they're just rotting on a big heap. But during their life, they're parked for 96% of the time. So when we talk about the barriers to autonomous driving, we say the ethical barrier. What happens if a fridge falls off the back of a car? On my left is a cyclist. I know I can uh, beat them and save the driver, but I'm killing somebody. And on my right is an SUV with five people in it. So it's an ethical dilemma. Uh, and there's a lot of battle around this, like how are we going to solve it, all this ethical dilemma. If you have a little, adorable little Swedish car just delivering itself on demand to you and you just step in and it is designed to be easy to drive and it's designed to be cool to drive and in parts of Europe you don't even need a full license to drive it. Uh, you can do 90 up to 130 kilometers an hour, mind you. It's not a dorky car uh, and it's really fast in that space. Then you drive to where you want to go, step out and then it can slowly deliver itself back to where it's got to go. It doesn't take up much space on the road. It's it's programmed to preserve human life at all times. Uh, it's just a significantly simpler challenge. And instead of having this mechanical system that you have to add all this shit onto, we, we don't do that. We design it with the electronic system and we design it for autonomy. Uh, that makes it significantly simpler. And in fact, if you guys check out, uh, we have a YouTube channel at uh, Unity where we show everyone what we're doing. And then the last episode from the end of last year, we. We put our, uh, we got this uh, electric car from India called the Mahindra Reva. We shipped it over here, and then we, we had a small robotic test platforms for all our autonomous stuff, and we transplanted all that software and all the sensors onto the, the big car so that we can be driving around. Uh, we did that in nine days. Nine days from, a, from nothing in the car. I mean, motor controller didn't work because most of the car was gone. Ha had to hack that and build the entire thing. 
had to add on like linear actuators for this, uh, linear potentiometers for the steering, uh, Hall effect sensors with this with this crude system on the on the hub so that we could check the speed. Like we had to invent the entire car and make it autonomous inside nine days. You can see that on YouTube. Check it up. Just yeah, Google it. Hmm? Uh, I think the big challenges in terms of interaction design, the really big challenges still lay ahead of us. Uh, they're going to be. There's going to be some parts that are very expensive to get through the regulatory regulations. Even though this environment is easier, there's some parts that are going to be expensive. Uh, the steer bar wire system itself is somewhat unfeasible in an M1 car, but in ours, it is feasible, but there are many parts of like functional safety that are going to be expensive. There are going to be challenges that we're all in on, because if you're good in that space, and we all remember Nokia, the new space is a space we, we want to be good at. Uh, so the major challenges lie ahead. Uh, for this first machine that we unveil, it's going to have, we have this weird uh, balance between what's already clear for regulations and what's the ideal machine. Um, and it's a bit of a balance. We, we don't want to present something that's completely unfeasible. I would say 90% of it's already ready for serial production when we unveil it. And we'll also show the virtual environment where, where it's uh, already manufacturing is being optimized soon to be implemented. But there's going to be parts that, um, yeah, there's going to be interesting challenges for some of the regulations. Um, we, we have a lot of innovations that are uh, part of the interaction design and are neither legal nor illegal, uh, which is, in my opinion, is a great place to be in. I, I love to negotiate and I like to lobby. And I think we're going to, I think Europe really wants to do something crazy. Like we need a good news story. We we need we need something impressive, but the major challenges lie ahead still. I would say. Mm. Yeah, I think we should say thank you, Louis. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.